Hello. Today we're here with novelist Colin McCann, who's going to read and discuss his novel from his novel, A Paragon. Welcome, Colin. Hello. How are you doing? All right. Well, um, I'm going to read from um, uh, the middle section of A Paragon. A Paragon is a, a novel um, that's done in a thousand and one cantos um, and it goes from one to 500 and then 500 down to one but in the middle is the section 1001 uh, based for obvious reasons uh, you know um, borrowing from the idea of uh, 1001 nights and and, and extending stories uh, out into the universe so that 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 we can we can live it's a sort of nod to Scheherazade um, so this is section 1001 once upon a time and not so long ago and not so far away, Rami Elhanan, an Israeli, a Jew, a graphic artist, husband of Nurit, father of Alik and Guy and Yigal, father too of the late Smadar, travelled on his motorbike from the suburbs of Jerusalem to the Kremazin Monastery in the mainly Christian town of Beit Jala, near Bethlehem, in the Judean hills, to meet with Bassam Aramin, a Palestinian, a Muslim, a former prisoner, an activist, born near Hebron, husband of Salwa, father of Arab and Arin and Muhammad and Ahmad and Iba, father too of the late Abir. Ten years old, shot dead by an unnamed Israeli border guard in East Jerusalem, almost a decade after Rami's daughter, Smadar, two weeks away from 14, was killed in the western part of the city by three Palestinian suicide bombers, Bashar Sawala, Yusef Shuli and Tawfiq Yassin, from the village of Asara al-Shamalia near Nablus in the West Bank, a place of intrigue to the listeners gathered in the red brick monastery perched on the hillside in the mountains of the beloved by the terraced vineyard in the shadow of the wall, having come from as far apart as Belfast and Kyushu, Paris and North Carolina, Santiago and Brooklyn, Copenhagen and Terijin, on an ordinary day at the end of October, foggy, tinged with cold, to listen to the stories of Bassam and Rami and to find within their stories another story, a song of songs discovering themselves, you and me, in the stone-tiled chapel where we sit for hours, eager, hopeless, buoyed, confused, cynical, complicit, silent, our memories imploding, our synapses skipping, in the gathering dark, remembering while listening all of those stories that are yet to be told. That's it from a paragon. Thank you, Colin. That's beautiful. And, you know, you mentioned Scheherazade and the idea of the storytelling. And I'm just wondering, as you make that novel, as you compose that novel, uh, what is the role of, of orality in uh, in that work and in all your work? Oh, well, I, I mean, it's incredibly important. I mean, first of all, my kids think I'm mad because I walk, walk around my house, you know, um, reading my work al aloud. Uh, and, and, you know, when they were very young, um, they would they'd say things like, there goes daddy saying the F word again. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, reading things, um, finding the music. I mean, this this, this particular section um, is yeah is about uh, singing and breathing. Uh, in in fact, uh, as well as you know, the signs that that, that come from all of that. Um, you know, for me, it's incredibly important as an Irish writer, uh, as any sort of writer, in fact, uh, to find the music um, uh, within, within the words. In fact, this whole novel to me was like composing a symphony. I was the conductor uh, of, of an orchestra and it was like, OK, contrabass now, uh, piano now. And then every now and then this instrument would come into the novel, um, uh, an instrument that I hadn't seen or heard of before, something from the deep consciousness. And I had to try and incorporate that ambient music in what's going on. This particular section, which is one sentence, um, was worked on very long and hard. It comes right in the middle of the novel. It gives the whole plot of the novel away. But also, for me, it was a huge discovery because, honestly, Phil, I, I had no idea while I was writing the novel who the narrator was. And I was racking my brains. I don't want it to be me. That's so boring. I do not want the narrator of the book just to be me, to be my, my, my voice. And then suddenly I discovered well, the 1001 notion. And, but I also discovered that the reader of the book was the narrator. And that's why I say in the section, you and me. And you become complicit um, in the story. And the story belongs to all of us. Once I knew that the reader of the book was the, was the narrator, um, 
I thought, that's it. Now, I don't know whether that's the, the, the cleverest thing I've ever co come upon or the stupidest, most obvious thing, because maybe with every book, the reader is the narrator. But in this one, I actually make the reader complicit uh, in the act of, you know, being being part of the story. And um, so for me, it was a very important page uh, in all sorts of reasons, thematically and so on, but really to get the sound of it um, entirely correct and the balance going on as well. You know, Colm, you, you, you say that's uh, uh, about the self being um, a boring narrator, perhaps a, a singular narrator. And the subtitle of this book is Voice and the Literary Tradition. And one of the things that's come up uh, is the idea that that somehow voice is not necessarily a singular thing. It's not necessarily a uh, owned or uh, or directed. And I think of your book as, uh, you know, this righteous testimony woven in dream language. And um, I'm wondering about that technique, about how that technique relates to, to voice or sound. Um, yeah. You know, tell us about uh, your idea of voice. My idea of voice, first of all, is that we get our voice from the voices of others. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things that, that we do as, as younger writers is we read and we develop and, and, and we mimic and we sing and we hear that music and it gets, in, it gets into our heads. But in particular, I would say to the younger writers out there, you know, read as broadly um, as, uh, as you can. Start listening across all sorts of genres to find the music. And in particular, for me, uh, it's about poetry. Now, I, I, you're a beautiful poet, but I couldn't write a poem to save my life. But poetry and sound and rhythm is incredibly uh, important. So I try to make sure that every sentence uh, has uh, a rhythm that sort of uh, you know will, will get into the reader's own head now you don't want to impose the rhythm um, upon the reader but you want them to find it because I mean the most interesting thing about about being a writer is not telling anybody uh, you know what to think because that's that's boring we're told all the time what to think but allowing somebody into a new sort of space and finding a music in that particular place is absolutely what, what, what voice is all about. And once you have the voice uh, in a story, everything follows. Um, the real difficult thing is finding the voice uh, in, uh, and uh, achieving the voice and then uh, maintaining it. Because every now and then you will lose it. You will lose the music of it. Don't, I mean, I keep referring to, 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 to music. We are uh, essentially musicians and, and, and the original voice, the original song was surely, uh, you know, that of uh, the person that wanted to uh, make you happy or make you sad or tell you that they, 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 they love you uh, through the sound of through, 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 through the sound of the words that they were they were doing. And for me, one last thing is for me, music is more important and meaning. Colin McCann, thank you for joining us. Sign and breath. Thank you so much.